Today on The Report, we speak to a double hurricane survivor. Israel bombs Lebanon and Palestine. Plus, new California bills taking action against AI. And Titan Well offers Narcan training. The Report starts now. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Justin Rosette. I'm Jasmine Alvarez. And I'm Gabriela Machuca. And I'm Noah Sicatis. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at The Report CSUF or on our Titan TV Instagram at Titan TV CSUF to keep in touch with us and view our latest content. After the devastation caused by Hurricane Helene just last week, Floridians and others in the southeastern United States have mere days to prepare for Hurricane Milton. Forming in the Gulf of Mexico, Milton reached a Category 5 overnight, measuring in as the second most intense tropical storm since Hurricane Rita in 2005. Milton began arriving over Florida late into the night on October 9th, measuring it at a Category 3 and continuing into the morning of October 10th before transitioning into a hurricane force extratropical low. We turn now to our reporter Madison Turner, who speaks with Okeechobee, Florida resident Jonathan DeSaro on surviving both storms. And welcome to the show, Jonathan. Hey, thank you for having me. We're going to ask you some questions, if you don't mind. Sure. sure. All right. The first question is, where were you during Helena Milton? Were you in an evacuation zone during each time, or did you evacuate? So for Helene, we were here in our home in Okeechobee, Florida. I actually live in an RV. Um, and so it was a little, we were a little skeptical about which, uh, if we should stay or not. Uh, we ended up staying. And thankfully, uh, everything turned out at our home. No damage, but around us, there was quite a bit of damage. For Milton, we actually evacuated um, out of our home about 100 miles south to Fort Lauderdale and rode the storm out there. Uh, it was way too dangerous for us to ride out through the house. Um, but thankfully, we had evacuated and we're safe down there. All right. The next question is, what was the move those around you leading up to both of the hurricanes? So for Helene, uh, hurricanes are kind of normal in Florida. <laughs> um, so we, no one was really worried about Helene, but when they saw Milton jump up above a category three, that's, I could see everyone, I could see fear in everyone's eyes whenever I talk to people about it. Um, so, and uh, for Helene, like there was a little bit of uh, people being scared, but not much. Uh, I feel like I, under a category three, people were like, oh, this is normal for Florida. <laughs> That is true. Um, the third question is, how much destruction did you see? And can you describe what the storms were like? So the storms were pretty rough. Um, Helene hit pretty hard as, I think it hit as a category one, if I'm, my memory serves me correct. Yes, it was um, category it one. Did, yeah, it did some damage. Um, there were a few buildings that the uh, roofs were knocked off the top of. Um, there were some siding knocked off of houses that I saw. Um, Milton was the real damage dealer. Um, for example, here in Okeechobee, we had a ranch that uh, all the buildings at the ranch were utterly destroyed, uh, all knocked to the ground. Um, there were 126 tornado warnings issued in Florida, um, just in our area uh, during Milton, um, destroyed multiple of uh, multiple buildings, uh, actually killed multiple people in Fort Pierce. Um, and I've actually got a chance to see some of the damage dealt. It's really bad. Um, houses, even uh, one of the locations of where I work was actually, um, there was damage dealt to there as well. Um, so just kind of getting to see the pictures, it's kind of horrifying to see all the damage that Milton did, but I'm just glad that mostly everyone is safe. Question four and a final question. How are you feeling now that the storms have passed? What is it going to be like moving forward? Uh, definitely making sure we prep more. Um, I feel like prep was kind of last second because uh, we weren't really expecting it. Uh, as I said earlier, her, anything Category 3 and under is kind of like, eh, it's just happening. So we weren't really prepped as much as we should have been. So definitely taking more into consideration when prepping for hurricanes. Um, and uh, just, I'm going to stay vigilant because I don't want to, I want to make sure we don't get hit by something out of uh, surprise again. So I will definitely be staying vigilant and keeping my eye out on there on the tracks. Hurricane season does end in November, and I do wish luck to you and your family uh, in the days coming forward. Thank you so much. Is there anything else you'd like to share? 
Uh, just make sure that everyone stays safe with their families. If there is warnings or anything like that in your area, please take them seriously. Do not, do not ignore them. They are serious warnings. Make sure you protect you and your family. All right, thank you for coming on today. Thank you for having me. Thank you to both Madison and Jonathan for joining us on this episode of The Report. We would like to dedicate this segment of our show to the numerous lives lost as a result of both hurricanes and to all first responders on the ground, ensuring the safety of many thousands amidst these tragic events. At the start of October, Nesset's Foreign Affairs and Security Committee moved forward a group of bills seeking to ban the UNRWA from operating in Israeli territory. These bills forbid any state authority from having contact with the agency. On Wednesday, October 9th, Israel carried out more than 1,100 airstrikes on southern Lebanon since ground operations began earlier this month. President Biden held a direct 30-minute phone call with Benjamin Netanyahu the same day as the strikes. A White House readout disclosed that Biden affirmed Israel's right to protect its citizens from Hezbollah, but to minimize harm on civilians. According to the Lebanon Health Ministry, more than 1,500 people have been killed in Lebanon and over 8,000 have been injured since Israel escalated its war on Hezbollah last month. Last of the morning of October 10th, an Israeli strike killed 28 Palestinians at a school in central Gaza. At least 42,000 Palestinians have been killed and another 95,000 are injured since Israel launched its war on Gaza on October 7th 2023. Lebanon's efforts to reach ceasefire in the country have increased. The Israeli cabinet is set to vote on their response as the deadly airstrike hit the Gaza school. This has left warnings from the U.S. following the evacuation orders and a thwarted terror plot linked to ISIS. However, Iran says it will keep supporting proxies in the region and will stand strongly by the resistance. Even then, the Lebanese military reported strikes hitting central Beirut with at least 18 killed and 92 injured. California lawmakers are cracking down on AI deepfake technology with three new Senate bills. The bills aim to combat the rising threat of artificial intelligence being used to create sexually explicit content, especially targeting minors. California Senator Aisha Wahab authored two of the bills, Senate Bill 926 and Senate Bill 981, claiming that there is a, quote, need to move forward with 21st century crimes, end quote. In 2023, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children's cyber tip line saw over 36.2 million reports related to suspected online child sexual exploitation. Senate Bill 926 will criminalize creation and disruption of sexually explicit and pornographic AI-generated images that have the intention of inflicting harm on the individual depicted. A state-mandated local program will be implemented as well. The Senate seeks to use the Bill 981 to strengthen protection against sexually explicit AI material on specifically social media platforms, such as Instagram and Snapchat, would be required to provide features that allow users to quickly report material shared without their consent. The sites would then promptly remove said content. In 2024 alone, over 500,000 deepfake videos and audio clips were reported in global circulation across multiple social media platforms with the primary usage of the software used in the creation of pornographic material. On September 19th, all three bills were signed into California state legislation by Governor Gavin Newsom and will go into effect by 2025. And now we turn to our reporter correspondent, Kem D. Nuosu, with the latest updates on the 2024 U.S. election. Take it away, Kem D. Thanks, Jasmine. Donald Trump's involvement in the storming of the Capitol is under scrutiny once again. A court filing of his attempt to overturn the 2020 election even before he lost has surfaced. In it, Trump knowingly pushed false claims of voter fraud. His lawyers argue that it is unfair to address the filing so close to the election, citing election interference. Republicans are taking the lead in the Senate uh, races in key states. Republicans in Congress are fighting to maintain their narrow majority as well. Speaker Mike Johnson insists, quote, the survival of the American dream depends on our victory, end quote. The Hands Off My Porn campaign has launched an anti-Project 2025 advertisement on porn sites. Project 2025 aims to ban pornography and imprison producers. As Harris is losing in the polls to Trump with men, this effort targets to win over young men that traffic these sites. Harris is currently under fire for owning a Glock. Despite Harris's background in law enforcement, many have accused her of hypocrisy. 
Her own gun legislative measures have high restrictions on weapon purchases, and while Harris claims to own her gun for self-defense, her home is currently protected by the Secret Service. And that's our rundown for this week. Don't forget to register to vote in our ballot poll, Titans. Back to you at the table. Titan Well, Cal State Fullerton's wellness initiative is offering opioid overdose and naloxone training for the fall semester. The training is hosted by the Health Promotion Services Substance Intervention and Prevention Team. The offering comes in response to the growing opioid crisis sweeping across the United States, an epidemic that has since claimed the lives of over 112,000 in the past year alone. Fentanyl, a powerful synthetic opioid, has been the culprit of these fatalities, often appearing in counterfeit pills and recreational drugs without the user's knowledge. Naloxone, also commonly known as Narcan, is a medicine that rapidly reverses an opioid overdose. Currently, naloxone can be bought over-the-counter at pharmacies throughout the state, but holds a price tag of anywhere between $20 to $45. However, students who utilize the offered training can receive free naloxone kits. In addition, participants will also receive free fentanyl testing strips, a resource that can detect the presence of fentanyl in substances before it is consumed. Currently, the program has trained over 500 Cal State Fullerton staff and students, showing large-scale efforts to raise awareness on how to recognize the signs of an overdose and how to administer naloxone. Faculty and staff can also join the select dates and receive naloxone kits, made possible by donations from the OC Multi-Ethnic Collaborative of Community Agencies. So far, there has already been one reported instance of naloxone successfully reversing an overdose. Trainings will be provided both virtually and in person. The next training is available October 23rd from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. at the Student Recreation Center. Those interested in participating can visit the Titanwell website for more information. So now that the university is trying to set this new health standard in terms of how they're approaching the fentanyl crisis by handing out these naloxone kits, how do we feel? Any thoughts, Justin? Um, I think it's a great idea. I think um, you never know when things can happen. Um, it's one of those things, I think, similar to like CPR training. You know, it's good to have in your back pocket if someone, um, you know, is overdosing on um, fentanyl. It's always good to have, whether you're um, out somewhere, whether you're with friends. I think it's one of those things that's always good to have. And I wasn't aware of this. I didn't know it was on campus, but I'm interested now, and I want to go do it because um, I want to be the person that potentially could save someone's life if that ever does happen. It's one of those things you don't think it will, but it's good to know if it does happen. That's true. We had one case. Right. Yeah. Right. I think it's just sad that we even need to have the Narcan on campus in order to deal with fentanyl overdoses. Mm -hmm. That that just goes to show how much of a problem it is. It is just in the country right now, and. I mean, we are pretty close to the southern border of Mexico, which is where a lot of this, these drugs are coming in through. And I think it's just really sad that we even have to have these protective measures for this, this problem. It should not be happening in the first place. Yeah, it is sad, definitely. I think nobody wants to hear that there's an right. epidemic, right, of a new drug or any drug at all. But I think it is necessary. And I Absolutely. do appreciate the fact that the university has done its part in trying mm -hmm. to combat the issue and trying to put their best foot forward mm -hmm. and get ahead of the problem because it is a problem and it is going on not just on our campus on all campuses and just across the nation where we're seeing so many deaths coming from fentanyl and even I know someone I was personally affected by someone who lost their life due to it so I think that it can be very beneficial I think if we can save lives why not I think if you have the opportunity to you get trained and perhaps carry, you know, something that can save someone's life. Why not? Just like what Justin's saying. Mm -hmm. um, it's better to be a potentially help and save a life than to be a bystander. Mm -hmm. you know? sure. Now to segue into um, another one of our stories. What are your thoughts on Harris owning a Glock for personal protection and self-defense? You know, there there is quite a debate because mm -hmm. she is protected by the Secret Service, but with the two Trump assassinations, mm -hmm. it is put into question. And so what are your thoughts? I'm really curious what you guys think. I think personally there's nothing inherently wrong with Kamala Harris owning a firearm for her own personal protection. I think there's there's nothing wrong with that. I think where a lot of the criticism comes from is the fact that her and the and as well as the Democratic platform for the past four years have really pushed this um, this kind of agenda of getting rid of um, getting rid of firearms with not not exactly getting rid of them, but um, in enacting legislation to limit the usage of assault rifles mm -hmm. and. They've kind of, the Democratic Party for the past 10 to 20 years has really pushed a platform of kind of trying to limit the usage of, 
of the Second Amendment. And now all of a sudden with the U.S. debate, the presidential debate, Donald Trump made a, a statement where he said they're going to take away your guns. And all of a sudden uh, the vice president announced, no, we're not going to do that. I'm a gun owner. And then at the vice presidential debate, Tim Waltz also said, oh, I'm a gun owner too. So all of a sudden there's this switch within, a lot of people have noticed this, there's this strange switch all of a sudden to, oh, we're actually like the pro-gun uh, people. We, uh, we own guns and we, like, we respect the right to protect ourselves. So it just seems a little hypocritical where the critics, at least for, for Kamala Harris, are stating this right now. And it goes back to the general criticism circle with uh, the vice president and how she was for fracking. Now she's against fracking and for fracking. I don't know where she stands right now on that, but a lot of people and a lot of critics of her um, her office right now are essentially stating she seems like a flip flopper. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of the general criticism c is coming from right now. What do you think? I think in terms of Kamala owning a gun, I think, um, I'm sure she owned one before the two right. um, assassination attempts on Donald Trump, but just seeing how those went and seeing how close his life was to being taken, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with her owning I a gun. Agree, yeah. I think um, her answer, she made that very clear at the debate, like Tim Walls and I are both gun owners. Mm -hmm. um, I think like you said, it can look um, hypocritical in terms of like, you know, for people that are kind of swing voters, like what do you really believe when it comes to guns? You exactly. know, like, do you think they should be taken away? Do you think they shouldn't? But um, for people that are up in arms about her owning a gun, I mean, I think that's her right. She worked yeah. in like that kind of a field before. So if she wants to be able, even though she is protected by a secret service, um, anything can happen, you know? And I think- She has all the um, right to. Yeah, she has all the right to. I agree with Justin, and if anything, I think we should expect someone who used to be in law enforcement to have some type of self-protection, mm -hmm. or at least anticipate that. And also, unfortunately, whoever is the candidate is going to be heavily scrutinized, mm -hmm. and we know this mm -hmm. in both of them. So, hypocrisy for both, but it's the unfortunate candidature. Definitely, I agree. I think you bring up good points with it looking hypocritical yes. um i think definitely there's there has to be a little bit more a clear line in the sand right as to where they stand i it is complicated though i think that they are trying to show you know they they do believe in the right to bear arms they're not trying to take away the the americans right to bear arms however they this is just my belief right i don't know but i think they probably are trying to just hold off on giving access gun access to people who it might be more dangerous to perhaps putting a little bit more barriers and seeing who is getting access to guns and also the kind of guns i mean there's a difference with ha owning a pistol and then owning an ak-47 right? right i think we can yeah. all agree on that and yes. i think that's part of what of the main debates of the Democra democratic party is pardon me is that they're trying to restrict more we weapons that are almost war weapons mm -hmm. that are now being carried into schools mm -hmm. and other public places where it is putting the lives of American cit citizens at risk. Um, but that being said, I also agree. I don't think there's anything wrong with her wanting to uh, protect herself and it is her American right. So yeah. You bring up a really good point about how these are almost like, these are straight up assault weapons mm -hmm. that are being, uh, being used and how they can potentially push forward a, a greater threat than having just a Glock on your on your persons. I think the real issue here with the idea of this this weapon is dangerous while well, this is okay to mm -hmm. have on myself for self-protection is if you look at the data right now with the FBI crime statistics, pistols kill more people generally. They're used more often and they ultimately take more lives per year. And that's the problem here is that it's, we're putting all this legislation into limiting the use of assault rifles, AR-15s, AKs, what have you, but what, we're really, what is really the killer right now is Glocks. And so that's really the issue is, if you really wanted to get rid of gun crime, or if you wanted to at least enact legislation to take away um, the right to bear arms, I think you should start with pistols. Because that, that's the killer, that's honestly. I think we should turn over to our next story, which is the AI deepfakes. Mm -hmm. So, the AI deepfakes in California and the potential limiting of them. Uh, have you guys uh, unfortunately come across any uh, deep fake content on social media before? Yes, but it was silly because it's all been celebrities and these big public figures and I haven't gotten any particularly salacious ones. So it's mm -hmm. just that uncanny valley mm -hmm. 
I do not want to explore deeper, mm -hmm. but I know it exists and it's unfortunate. I saw, I think it was an interview or a quote from Jenna Ortega talking about how when she was a minor, she saw explicit yeah. AI deepfakes of herself. Yeah. And I can't imagine growing up, you already have the pressures of being under the spotlight mm -hmm. and now you're seeing yourself in this way that you did not consent to be seen and you know that people are consuming it and because mm -hmm. it's social media you can see what people are commenting you can see what people are sharing and it's just so disgusting and I'm sure that that did not help her in terms of her own health and perception of herself yeah I think when it comes to artificial intelligence it seems like it's just sprung on us so fast like within yeah. the last couple of years like things have just taken so many steps and I think AI is one of those things where it's fun until it isn't, right? You're doing your homework. Exactly. I'm, let me use ChatGPT. Let me like listen to this song. Did my favorite artists, like, they're now on a song that they didn't make because of AI. You know, it's like things like that. But when it comes to things like this, like people being sexually exploited, it's like it's disgusting, you know. And I think it's great that with these laws being passed, people are going to start being punished for these things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like uh, we talked about before the show, like the 21st century crimes. You know, with new things coming into fruition, new crimes need to be dished out. Mm -hmm. And people that are making these sexually explicit things, especially of children, is absolutely disgusting. They need to be punished. Um, just because you're not doing something physically doesn't mean that it's not still damaging, you know? It's, they need to be punished. It's very true. Um, I think this is also going to do great um, great works for limiting the amount of revenge porn that's, that can be carried out. Because ultimately, what this can do, it, not saying it is, it most more than likely is, what it does is this is honestly just giving tools for these kind of um, actions to take place. Mm -hmm. So... Yes, unfortunately, um, these bills, do you guys think these bills are gonna work in the long run with getting rid of sexually explicit AI content? Yeah, I think over time these bills will definitely start to help. Um, I think there's one bill we talked about as well where now on social media when you see an AI video, it's gonna tell you that it's AI. There's gonna be like a marker there. So I think when it comes to these cases, like you said with Jenna Ortega, um, a lot of times people don't know if that's real, if it's fake, if this is real sexual videos that they're seeing. So I think it's gonna help us to be able to report videos and get those kinds of videos off the internet. And with that, that's all we have the time for today. Have a good week, everyone. And stay tuned for more news, views, and info. We'll see you all next time on The Report.